Hi, everyone. You are here. We made it. Welcome. Welcome. I am Stephanie Murray. I'm director of the Center for Cooperative Media at Montclair State University. And I am so thrilled to welcome you to the 2020 Collaborative Journalism Summit. Yay, it's here. So we're all a bit nervous, but really excited to host this year's summit in place rather than in person. But it really was an easy decision for us to make. Um, we knew we couldn't postpone the summit because collaboration is really important and it's especially important right now. We also knew that the community of practice of collaborative journalism practitioners that we've built around the world is a very flexible and supportive bunch and you'd come along with us on this adventure, and you really have. Um, we had more than 750 people register for this year's summit. We don't expect that everyone will be on it all the time because we do have a lot of people who registered from countries around the world. Um, the summit when it started was very US focused, but a lot of our work now has been turning global as have a lot more collaborations that we study as well. We also have 70 speakers lined up for you today and tomorrow. So uh, this is definitely going to be the biggest collaborative journalism summit that we've ever hosted. And we're really thankful that you're here. So I also just wanna take a moment before we start to acknowledge the moment that we're in. I know that many of you joining us today are working really long hours. Some of you are now caretakers for relatives. Your grown children have moved home. You're taking care of very young children. Some of you have been furloughed, you're laid off. Maybe you don't have steady work right now or you're just really nervous about your future. And I wanna acknowledge that. Our surveys every year show that the Collaborative Journalism Summit is seen as a positive and welcoming event. And I hope that continues this year, I know it will. And I really hope that over the next day and a half that we can focus on the good work that we can do together when we collaborate. I hope we can lift up that work and I hope that we can hold space to figure out how to build partnerships that strengthen our communities, especially now. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank our sponsors. So the collaborative journalism program that we've built at the Center for Cooperative Media has really been built on a shoestring, shoestring budget over the last few years. And without the support of our summit sponsors, we couldn't make any of this happen. So I first want to thank the Knight Foundation. So the Knight Foundation has been with us from the start. They've been one of our most fervent supporters and we are just so grateful that they stuck with us for this year's summit too. Thank you tonight. Thank you also to the North Carolina Local News Lab Fund. Um, when we first started hunting locations for this year's summit, when it was going to be in person, we knew we were gonna go to North Carolina and the folks at the North Carolina News Fund, not only Local News Lab Fund, not only helped us find people on the ground to connect with, they helped sponsor this year's conference and stuck with us when we moved in place. So thank you to the fund. Thank you also to Democracy Fund. So Democracy Fund has been one of the core supporters of the center and our collaborative journalism work over the last few years. And we're just so grateful to Teresa, Josh, Christine, and the entire team there. Thank you. Thank you, of course, to American Press Institute, too, who is back with us again sponsoring this year's summit. Kevin and his team, Amy, Tom, everyone there has always been a big supporter and just an excellent colleague for us in this field, so thank you. Thank you to Google News Initiative, who's back with us this year. So Google sponsored the first collaborative journalism summit that we ever had, and that sponsorship really helped to get us off the ground. So I'm just really grateful that they're back again this year. And thank you to the John S. Knight Journalism Fellowships Program at Stanford University, uh, which I know some of you on the summit call today um, have been a part of. JSK has been a fantastic supporter of the summit and several fellows have gone on to do excellent work in the field of collaborative journalism. Thank you also to Education North Carolina, Education NC. This is the second year that EdNC has sponsored our conference. And I'm also thankful to them for sticking with us when we moved in place instead of in person. And of course, big thank you to our home base at the Center of the School of Communication and Media at Montclair State University. Thank you so much because without Montclair State, our work would not be possible. So I also wanna thank and very briefly introduce our staff some of whom you're going to see over the next day and a half and some of whom will be behind the curtain for most of the time. 
Um, so thanks first to our associate director, who's the man who will probably be behind the curtain the most, Joey Ambitas. Thanks, Joe. Thank you also to our event planner, Denise Shannon. So Denise will be helping to moderate the chat today and tomorrow, and so you'll see her popping in and out. So hi, and thanks, Denise. Thank you to Ned Burke, who has helped wrangle so many of our speakers and who also will be working with Denise to moderate the chat. So thanks to Ned. I also want to thank our program designer and our support staffer, Hannah Kestenbaum. Thank you to Mark Glazier for helping with sponsors. And thank you to Sarah Stanbilly and Maria, Mariela Santos Nunez, who are helping us with the live note taking document. Um, so, before we get to our first panel, I just want to go over a few housekeeping items and make sure that you know about also some fun side activities that we're planning to host. So, first, um, for every panel, you're going to notice that one of our panelists is silent but very busy. That's because we've hired graphic recorder Derek Dent to do live illustration during each discussion. We'll also be exporting and sharing Derek's illustrations after the event so that you can take a closer look. Second, um, as I mentioned, we're going to be moderating the chat and trying to keep it very active and alive. So please participate as I think you already have started. Share your thoughts, your ideas, your questions for each other. And as I mentioned, uh, Denise and Ned will be doing moderating for the chat for us. So third, anytime that you have questions for any of the panelists, we're gonna ask that you use the Q&A feature. So the chat we really want to say for conversation between um, folks in the audience and for sharing links and ideas. But if you've got a question for a panelist, many of our sessions today and tomorrow will have Q&A at the end. So we ask that you put uh, questions for panelists in the Q&A box, which you should see at the bottom of your screen. So fourth, as I mentioned um, a couple moments ago, we are also running a live note-taking document. So we'll drop a link to that in the chat as well, and you'll be able to comment on that. And we've got two folks who will be doing live note-taking for us throughout the summit. So fifth, thanks to Otter, we're also running live transcription. And so we hope that some folks will be able to follow along that way, um, especially if you have troubles listening in. So to access that, you can either use the link that we'll share in the chat, or if you look in your Zoom window now, you should see a box that says custom live streaming service. You can click that drop down and view the stream to see the live transcription. Also to bring some levity and a little bit of fun to this year's summit, we've made some Zoom bingo cards. I'm sure you've seen Zoom bingo cards. So we modify them to make them a little bit more appropriate to the Collaborative Journalism Summit and Collaborative Journalism in general. So we'll drop a link to those in the chat, download them, use them. I already know from our pre-conference sessions this morning that a few folks probably hit bingo. But note that there are no prizes, um, it's just for fun only. We also hope that you're gonna share what you learn on social media with the hashtag CollaborativeJ. We're going to be live tweeting about the conference from our Twitter handle as well, Center Coop Media. So you can retweet us there and please follow along that way. I also wanna note that we're using Padlet, which we'll drop a link to this in the chat as well, to run an asks and offers board. And that's where any attendee can leave links to open jobs, highlight your skills if you're looking for a job perhaps, your availability or anything else that you want to. And last, tonight at 5 p.m. Eastern, we will be hosting an hour long, very relaxed and fun networking session that I invite everyone to partake in. So it'll be hosted by Lewis Raven Wallace of Press On and will feature live animation by visual artist and puppeteer, Billy D. So that'll be a fun way to network and end the day. So with that, let's get into North Carolina. So there was a very specific reason why we intended to host this year's summit in North Carolina. That's because right now it truly is the state of collaboration in many ways. There's just so much innovation and partnership happening across the entire state that we knew that we wanted to put a spotlight on it. So early on, Melanie Sill and Lizzie Hazeltine were amazing partners in helping us make sure we got connected to everyone we needed to on the ground in North Carolina. And we're so honored that the North Carolina Local News Lab Fund, which they lead, contributed to the conference this year with a sponsorship. So now I would like to hand the stage over to them for some welcoming sponsor remarks. Thank you so much, Stephanie, Joe, Ned, Denise, and the whole center team. Uh, as Stephanie mentioned, I'm Lizzie Hazeltine, the fund coordinator for the North Carolina Local News Lab Fund. And we are delighted to support the Collaborative Journalism Summit, uh, which seems like it's here in North Carolina, at least in spirit, as we kick off with this amazing panel about what's, what's happening here. Um, 
I'm also excited that in a moment when there's uncertainty, we can celebrate the progress that we have made together. Uh, the fund itself is a pooled fund at the North Carolina Community Foundation with support from Democracy Fund, the Educational Foundation of America and other national partners. Uh, we've been in operation since 2017. Um, and th since 2018, we've deployed just shy of a million dollars and have another $300,000 that we're ready to deploy now uh, with the current round of grants we have available for North Carolina news and information orgs and others serving news and information needs. Uh, along with that grant making, we've done a significant amount of informal capacity building, convening and connecting both with grantees and the broader ecosystem to ensure that North Carolina residents, all of them, uh, have the news and information they need to participate in community and civic life and determine their own futures. We do this by supporting a broad variety of organizations from youth media in the mountains and at the beaches to running summits for independent publishers, supporting hurricane recovery, coverage and community engagement, and supporting this year's cohort of North Carolina Report for America Fellows. You'll also hear about an investigative collaboration uh, with the Carolina Public Press that we are proud to support later in the conference. As you can imagine in this critical moment, we've seen significant collaboration evolving uh, around the existing inequalities in the state, including the overlapping impacts of hurricanes, poverty, race, and the current pandemic. Even amid those challenges, we see real momentum in North Carolina, growing collaboration and community service that you'll hear about more in this panel. And we're excited now to share with you that we've further invested in that momentum by establishing the North Carolina Local News Workshop with a grant to Elon University. Uh, I would like to introduce you to the women who will lead the launch of that workshop, Dr. Rochelle Ford, who is the Dean of the School of Communications at Elon University, and Melanie Sill. Rich Dr. Ford, if you would tell us more about Elon's role in this collaboration and our plans for the future. Did. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much, Lizzie. Um, I also want to thank the contributors to the North Carolina um, Local News Lab Fund for partnering with Elon University to establish the local news workshop. Um, we will be using these funds to help ensure that North Carolinians have access to news and information so that they can participate in democratic processes and community engagement. Beginning in June, the workshop will be housed at Elon University in the School of Communications, which offers programs in journalism, media analytics, interactive media, communication design, strategic communications, sport management, and cinema and television arts. Elon's main campus is located in central North Carolina near Burlington, but we offer programs and classes in Greensboro and in the Research Triangle. We envision the workshops program supporting the entire state in face-to-face -face and virtual activities and programming. The workshop will create more opportunities for innovation, access to local news throughout the state, including opportunities for internships and staff, faculty, community co collaborations. The workshop practical programming aims to really equip journalists and other communicators with skills and tools to serve diverse communities. The workshop will focus on connecting the North Carolina news and information ecosystem through initiatives like the North Carolina local e-newsletter, collaborating with news and information providers to offer innovative programs, coaching and resources, and capacity building through analytics and the North, North, North Carolina local news intern core. This partnership with the Local News Lab Fund is a direct response to our state's deepening local news um, crisis really by establishing this new statewide support base for those working to inform North Carolina residents and communities. And it helps to facilitate the university's ongoing commitment to our state and complement other programs at Elon, like the Elon Poll, the Elon Immigration um, Clinic, the Center for Organizational Analytics, and the North Carolina Open Government Coalition. Elon is excited to welcome as interim director of the workshop, Melanie Sell. Melanie was instrumental in bringing the Sunshine Center for the North Carolina Open Government Coalition to Elon more than a decade ago. She also has been working as a consultant with the Local News Lab Fund and the Democracy Fund, and she has an established 
distinguished career as a former top editor and a news executive at the News and Observer, the Sacramento Bee, and KPCC. Melanie, would you like to share a little bit more about the workshop? Uh, thank you, Dr. Ford. Thank you, Lizzie. And hello to friends I have met, and hello to all the friends I haven't yet met. It's really uh, it's such a treat to have this opportunity to help launch the NC no Local News Workshop and the chance to tell you how we'll get going. As you can tell from the lineup for this panel, and as many of you know, there's a lot happening on North Carolina's local news scene. Uh, I have to say our newsrooms are hitting it out of the park and covering the COVID crisis. And at the same time, uh, trying different things in terms of how they cover communities, how they work together, how they do community outreach. There's just um, amazing commitment I see from our local journalists. We also are lucky to have some great national and regional organizations supporting journalism, like the Solutions Journalism Network's uh, Southern Manager and the Center for Local Media at UNC, the Reporters Lab at Duke. So this is a rich uh, landscape of local news. And that's where we want to come in with the local news workshop as a force multiplier and as a booster to support local news as the critical civic infrastructure it is for North Carolina. There is a local news crisis and we, we can't deny that. But we want to focus on all of this spark that's happening around the state. We do start with a focus on what North Carolinians need from local news in terms of high quality and accessible news and information. And we want to support the people and organizations that are trying to reinvent local news as a service. So I'll just run through quickly uh, these three C's, capacity building, convening, and connecting. And some examples. The North Carolina Local Intern Corps is a, an effort to offer some capacity building. This came in response to needs we heard about when we did a survey recently of local journalists. We heard that many students had had their internships or jobs canceled, taking away professional development opportunities. And we also heard that newsrooms are running wide open trying to cover the COVID crisis and they need extra capacity, especially this summer. So the uh, local news workshop will fund four interns and professional editor to manage them. They'll generate their own story ideas and they'll work with newsrooms to get ideas covered. And they'll also focus on community questions and needs. And everything they produce will be available to any North Carolina news organization. Convening will bring people together for knowledge sharing, training, workshopping, problem solving, brainstorming. An example of this is last summer we sponsored a gathering in Southern Pines of eight independent publishers with a focus on reader revenue. And we followed up in a partnership with API to provide uh, coaching. We will bring them back together later this year with some others to share the results and identify some ways to move forward. And then for connecting, the NC Local Weekly email newsletter that Ryan Tuck now edits will move under the workshop umbrella and will continue to build on that. So if you want to keep up with this and learn more, ncnewsworks.org, ncnewsworks.org is where you can uh, watch the news, uh, the local news workshop take shape. Thank you again for the chance to tell you all about it. I'm looking forward to hopefully working with many of you in the next uh, year or so. Thank you. Thank you so much to the North Carolina Local News Lab Fund. Um, and congratulations to you too. I mean, that is a fantastic initiative, fantastic. Um, and I know it's gonna be really successful. So if the panelists for the North Carolina panel can please identify themselves. And while you're doing that, um, we're gonna move into talking about this panel. So next, we're gonna take a deep dive into exactly what is happening in North Carolina. Some of which um, Lizzie, Rochelle and Melanie just referenced. So don't forget that also that this panel will have an audience Q&A at the end. So again, if you have any questions for any of the panelists, drop them in the Q&A and we will get to them at that point. So our moderator for today's panel is Charles Thomas. So Charles is the Charlotte Program Director for the Knight Foundation. There he leads a program of work that's focused on fostering and supporting equitable development in the historic West End District. And I see that Charles has joined us now. So Charles? Floor is yours. Take it away, sir. There we go. go. All right, great. Thank you guys so much. So again, can you guys, you guys can hear me, right? Go for it. You're all set. All right. 
Um, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it is my pleasure to host this wonderful panel. Again, my name is Charles Thomas. I am the program director for the night for Charlotte uh, for Knight Foundation. Um, and I want to start by just acknowledging that I am not a journalist. I do not have a journalism background. Um, my work in Charlotte is focused around uh, the civic engagement side to what we do um, in a neighborhood called the Historic West End that's going through rapid change. Um, but over the past few years, I've been just delighted and fascinated to learn more about the industry and first came across the, the idea of collaboratives and learning about the, the Philadelphia Collaborative um, and was just heartened um, in the last um, 18 months to hear that the, the launch of the Charlotte Journalism Collaborative, um, which has a focus on affordable housing. So I'm just thrilled to hear about all the wonderful work that's happening in North Carolina, and I'm excited to take a deep dive into the work um, that's happening here around collaboration in our community. So our panelists are going to start off by introducing themselves, giving us a little bit of background of their work and their work around collaborations in North Carolina. Um, and then once all of our panelists have introduced themselves, then I'll ask uh, two or three questions and then we'll open it up to the audience to um, ask your questions about uh, what's been happening in North Carolina. So let's start off with Alicia Bell from Free Press. Hey everyone, my name is Alicia. Um, I am based here in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, and I'm the, the organizing manager for a project called News Voices as an organization called Free Press. Uh, the work that we do is to build power with communities to better ensure a future of journalism that works for all of us. Um, so three of the collaboratives that I'm involved in that we are a part of. The first one is Word Up, which is a collaborative of community organizers and community members working to share community news and information across Eastern North Carolina. That work came out of some uh, information needs mapping and dream saloning, um, asking folks what their dreams were for the future of local news. Um, and this was something that community members decided that they wanted to create. Um, and so we worked with them to support that to meet information needs and storytelling needs in Eastern North Carolina. The second one, it's a collaborative of Black Charlotte residents called Building Black Community. Um, and this is a, a collaborative of residents who came out of a partnership with the Charlotte Mecklenburg Public Library. Um, and so in partnership with the Public Library, we hosted a series of workshops. And out of that series of workshops, there were community members who wanted to continue working together um, to figure out how to build and transform relationships between Black journalists and Black community members. Um, and so they created an, uh, an event and continued to organize with each other and work in collaboration with one another to figure out how to strengthen those relationships. Um, and then the third place where I, I have a role is in the Charlotte Journalism Collaborative, um, which I'm sure other people will talk about. It's a collaborative of newsrooms and community partners. Um, and the work that I'm doing and that we're doing through News Voices is to strengthen the collaboration between non-newsroom communities and the newsroom partners and community partners who are a part of the collaborative. Um, so the, I think there was a question about kind of what is the impact of this work and why collaboration. Um, and so the first reason uh, for doing this work and the reason why we do this is because there's a powerful history and precedent for journalists collaborating with their communities. Um, over here to the, to the left, you'll see this story by Marvell Cook, which was um, about the Bronx slave market. Marvell Cook went on later on um, to partner with Ella Baker, who was one of the founding members of SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Um, to republish a five-part series about the Bronx safe market. Um, so this is just an example of the history that exists um, for collaboration between journalists and non-journalists in communities. The second reason we do this work um, is because communities are already creating ways to meet information needs without newsrooms all the time. Um, and so it's much better and much more fruitful and reaches more people and much more impactful if we do this work together. Um, so to the left, you'll see an example of a community member in Charlotte who created this community-led resource map um, in response to the coronavirus. And so this kind of work is work that we've seen in other places. Um, Chicago City Bureau launched something similar. Um, and that's an example of where newsrooms really can collaborate with communities to make sure that information needs are getting met. We do this because other people tell stories and provide information and our impact is greater together. Um, journalists, artists, community organizers, and there could be so many more circles in this Venn diagram are meeting information and storytelling needs. And so if we're doing that work in collaboration with one another, um, then we know that work's gonna be more impactful and it's gonna reach more people and it's gonna reach hearts and minds in different ways. 
Um, you can't create a future of journalism that works for all people without talking to and working with all kinds of people. Um, so it's, an, it's important that we bring in the voices of non-journalists who are just as impacted by the future of journalism as journalists are. And then finally, powerful communities sustain powerful infrastructure. And so we know that we need to be collaborating with non-journalists, with all kinds of community partners to build up the strength and power of our communities. Um, because the thing we see with schools, roads, hospital systems, et cetera, is that powerful communities sustain powerful institutions and infrastructure. Um, and if we want that for the future of journalism, then it requires collaboration with our communities. Charles, you go ahead. Thanks, Alicia. Pass it to the next person. Yeah, um, let's hear from uh, David Borax from WFAE. Thanks, Charles. Uh, I've been an editor, reporter, and producer for about 40 years in local news in Asia for national business publications and publisher of my own local news network here near Charlotte, and most recently in public media. And collaboration has always been part of what I have done, but uh, more so in recent years, absolutely. Um, in, in the time that I was publishing local news network near Charlotte, it was an online only daily newspaper for the communities in the suburbs north of Charlotte. And uh, I did have collaborations at that time with both the Charlotte Observer and then later WFAE where I work now. Uh, and those were somewhat collaborations of necessity for me. I didn't have a big staff to work with. Uh, the opportunity to share content with other publications was attractive to me. And I think they saw a benefit in getting some content that they couldn't get anywhere else. So that kind of collaboration was kind of a daily basis as news arose. Um, it was somewhat loosely organized and informal according to the news flow. Um, at WFAE, uh, it, collaboration is a part of everything we do, it seems. And uh, I want to talk about a few of those things. Um, right now, uh, some of you may be familiar, we had a panel this morning talking about the Charlotte Journalism Collaborative, and that's an ongoing collaboration between a uh, half dozen news outlets in Charlotte that's focusing on the affordable housing crisis in our city. Um, and this involves story meetings with reporters. Uh, there's travel funding to look at what's happening elsewhere and bring ideas back to the market here in Charlotte. Uh, for example, I went to Atlanta to look at uh, YIMBY movements there. Yes, in my backyard. Those are situations where folks are actively encouraging the development of housing in their areas as opposed to other movements elsewhere, NIMBY movements, where people don't want any of this stuff. Um, some of my colleagues in the collaborative, Nate Morabito from WCNC-TV, went to Nashville to look at some interesting things that are happening there. Chris Rudisill from QNotes went to Colorado. Uh, Lauren Lindstrom from the Charlotte Observer went to Seattle to look at what they're doing. And uh, we've shared our stories with one another. They have aired uh, in some form or been published in some form at all the news outlets. Uh, one of our partners is La Noticia. It's a Spanish language uh, newspaper, and they th many of our stories are translated back and forth between English and Spanish to allow them to run across the network. Um, and we can talk more about that later, and I think uh, my colleague Glenn Birkins from uh, Q City Metro is also with us and can talk about that. Um, I also was involved uh, in January in a project called Caught Off Guard. Uh, in which I worked with Inside Climate News. That's an online Pulitzer Prize winning news service that looks at climate uh, and environmental coverage. And they convened back in September last year, a group of reporters from around the Southeast. Uh, and we talked about uh, both the broader topic of climate change and we had some seminars on that. And then we also uh, decided to come up with a project to look at how state and local governments have responded to climate change. And that project ran uh, all at once uh, both on Inside Climate News and in, at all of the news outlets that were participating. And uh, we're looking at other collaborations in the future. And I think uh, uh, somewhere in this uh, collaboration journalism summit, uh, Vernon Loeb from Inside Climate News will be talking as well. Um, and then, as I mentioned, WFAE is involved in collaborations all the time. And this can include special programming or weekly news stories, that sort of thing. Um, we have weekly uh, segments on the air, like our Friday News Roundup, in which we invite journalists from other news outlets around Charlotte to join in a discussion of the week's news. And it's great, I, I'm involved in those a uh, couple times a month, and it's great to uh, get to be working side by side with folks from other news outlets who bring both 
different perspectives and different subject matter that they cover. So um, that's one way that we do it. We also invite journalists from other news outlets to come in for uh, two ways, Q and A's on the air. Um, and those are, uh, could be something like a project that ran in the Charlotte Observer where we invite the journalists who work on that project to come in and share what they learned with us. Uh, we have weekly segments that are regular. Uh, we have one called Bizworthy with Tony Messia who works for a, a startup that he founded called uh, Charlotte Biz Ledger. Uh, he comes in once a week to talk about business news in the market. Uh, we also uh, work with Langston Wirtz, a sports writer from the Charlotte Observer who comes in for just a good four minute discussion of whatever's happening in the sports world. And it, uh, the, things like this give us access to subjects that we have not focused on in the past. And frankly, we don't have the staff to focus to, to work on right now. It gives us a kind of a broader reach than a broader subject matter than we would have had otherwise. And then we have a long time collaboration with other public media around North Carolina. And uh, that takes the form of everything from when we produce stories every day, we share them over a network that so that they can be picked up by the other news outlets. Uh, and that means on the air and then also on the web. Uh, they're using the, the interface that we have with the NPR news system. We can share stories easily among newsrooms, both from NPR and among the news outlets in North Carolina. Um, we've produced hour long broadcast specials. Uh, for example, during Hurricane Florence in 2018, we did a nightly broadcast uh, with news that was collected from all the stations that were covering it. Um, we did election specials over the last couple of years. Um, and then most recently, we did a, an hour long special called Coronavirus in North Carolina, the statewide impact of COVID-19. And we produced that with uh, four or five other stations around the state and it aired statewide. Um, we also have worked with North Carolina Public Television on different things, uh, including uh, a, an interview a couple of years ago that I did with Senator Tom Tillis that aired on one of their business programs. And just, I would say that I think collaborations have become easier and more palatable for journalists as our industries changed. You know, there's a, a shared sense of our broad mission and that feeds a desire to collaborate where it's appropriate. Um, and we also have some new financial imperatives. We can't get to everything, but we want our audiences to have it. And so I think that is making collaborations more common these days. Thanks, David. Uh, we're gonna move on to Glenn Birkins with QC Metro. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me. I'm Glenn Birkins. I published the website QCityMetro.com. Uh, we launched in November 2008 to provide news and information for the African-American community here in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. When, um, when we talk about collaboration, I'm reminded of, uh, of a uh, country song that Barbara Mandrell once sung. Uh, and if you uh, and uh, and I uh, hope we're under Vegas rules that I'm a country fan, but uh, she sung a song called "I Was Country When Country Wasn't Cool." And in Charlotte, we were collaborators long before collaboration was cool. Frankly, uh, as I said this morning at the at the uh, workshop, uh, because of some visionary and forward-thinking leadership of people. Uh, like Rick Timms and uh, Jill O'Connor. Years ago, Charlotte Media began to look for ways to collaborate, and Q City Metro has been a part of that. Uh, one of the first collaborations we had was with my former employer, the Charlotte Observer. Later on, there was a collaboration, a larger collaboration funded, uh, funded by the National Endowment for the Arts, where local media in Charlotte came together to fill the vacuum caused by uh, staff cuts. And those staff cuts were cutting, were, uh, were affecting the arts coverage in a, uh, in a uh, particularly damaging way. Uh, we've, uh, we've partnered with organizations, Q City Metro has, that we would have once considered competitors. Uh, the, the Charlotte Post, which is a legacy black newspaper, uh, we've we've partnered with them on on events, and we're currently looking for ways to partner with them on some things that are happening now. One of the things we're doing under a grant from the Knight Foundation, uh, Charles mentioned the uh, historic West End, which is which is a historically African American black part of town. Uh, under a grant from the Knight Foundation, we're trying to create what 
what I hope will be a grassroots focused and collaborative news organization there to provide the news and information that those residents need. And, uh, and uh, we're in conversation with, uh, with the Charlotte Post in terms of how they might become a part of that, even though they are not technically part of that, uh, part of that uh, grant project. And finally, uh, like David, I am part of the Charlotte Journalism Collaborative, uh, originally created to, to bring a solutions uh, journalism focus to the housing shortage that is in Charlotte. Uh, now that COVID-19 is here and it's having such, a, such an impact on Mecklenburg and Charlotte, uh, we are going to shift that focus for now at least uh, to focus on uh, COVID-19. Uh, we recently got one of the night, uh, one of the one of the uh, Facebook grants to uh, to uh, enhance our COVID-19 coverage, and we're going to uh, look around for other partners in in Charlotte who can join us and enhance whatever we are going to do uh, with that with that money. So thank you again for being here, and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Glenn. And uh, Sienna um, with Scallywag, can you, can you go ahead and introduce yourself? Hi, y'all. Um, my name is Sierra Hinton. I am the executive director publisher at Scallywag. Um, I'm also the director of network building and operations at Press On. Um, but today I'm going to focus on my work um, with Scallywag. Uh, Scalawag is a journalism and storytelling organization that illuminates dissent, unsettles dominant narratives, pursues justice and liberation, and stands in solidarity with marginalized people and communities in the South. Um, we are a regional publication based in Durham, North Carolina, and we're in our sixth year of publication. Um, when I think about collaboration, um, I think about it in sort of, sort of its purest form, and that's action. Um, the action of working with others to produce or create. Um, and when I think about uh, who Scalawag is collaborating with, um, I think about our collaborations with other publications, especially those with shared values, uh, individual community members, um, and movement and community organizations. Um, at Scalawag, we partnered with a number of organizations to produce and co-publish content um, our managing editor, Levy Cooper, talks about the varying success of that, um, of these collaborations and um, Anjali Shaw's Building Equity and Journalism Collaborations report um, that came out recently. Um, and, you know, sometimes those just look like co-publishing opportunities. Sometimes it is um, a deeper commitment uh, to collaboration together. Um, a newsroom co collaboration that um, we have really loved and appreciated is our work with Southerly Magazine. Um, a great example of this is with Southerly, we went after funding support together to produce a collaborative reporting series called Power Lines, which covered um, climate change, environment, environmental justice, and infrastructure in the South. Um, for, that report, for that reporting, we've received support from the Buell Center for the Study of American Architecture at Columbia University. Um, beyond that, Southerly shares our commitment to the South um, and many of our values. So um, it's not just the work that we're able to produce together. Um, it is the way that we're able to um, move forward things that we care about. Um, and, and so in that way, it feels like whenever they win, um, we win. And that's something that is really important to us um, in the collaborations that we do with other newsrooms. Um, when we talk about collaboration with individual community members, um, Lau May comes to mind. Lau has been writing with us since 2016. Um, Lau is many things, and the following is in no way the sum of his identity, but he is currently incarcerated on death row here in North Carolina. Um, I won't go into too much detail because my teammate, uh, Dr. Daniel Purifoy, will be talking tomorrow about our work with Lau um, during the 11 a.m. lightning talks. Uh, but I did want to say, um, when we talk about collaborations with individuals, we are really thinking about collaboration as a way to hand over our platform to members of our community um, that have been historically and perpetually denied a voice. Uh, finally, talking about uh, collaboration with movement and community organizations. Um, at Scalawag, collaboration with movement has meant making the work of our movement partners more visible. 
Um, examples of organizations we partnered with in this way are BYP 100, Southerners on New Ground, and Down Home North Carolina. It is important to us to use our platform to build awareness of their work uh, because there is an overlap with who they are building with and who we at Scalawab want to create news with. In that way, our strategies align and our goals are the same, to shift power and get our communities what they need to change the conditions of their lives for the better. Thanks y'all and excited to be a part of this conversation with you. Thank you, Sierra. Um, now we're gonna move to Susan Lay at uh, UNC Chapel Hill's Center for Innovation and Sustainability in Local Media. Hello, y'all. How's everybody doing? Um, again, my name is Susan Leith uh, with the Center for Innovation, Sustainability, and Local Media. Is this presentation showing? Yeah, but you got to hit present so we can. Okay. Get it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You're all, right, all good. Everybody. Go ahead. How's everybody doing? <laughs> Thank you guys for having me. I'm so excited to be here and be a part of the conversation. Again, I'm Susan Leith with the Center for Innovation, Sustainability, and Local Media. I'm going to talk to you about the center's work, but I also wanted to talk with you a little bit later about the work of the Ida B. Well Society, so I want to share that as well. Um, what the center does, um, three areas, you see a familiar face there, Glenn, <laughs> three areas of the center is the UNC Knight Foundation uh, Table Stakes Newsroom Initiative. The entire center is funded by uh, Knight Foundation. The Table Stakes Initiative is a year-long program that helps media organizations identify challenges and opportunities, frankly, to build sustainability, um, to survive and thrive in the digital age. Um, we have our program outcomes include, we have coaches that guide participants and organizations through program to reach Oh, for some reason this is not, you guys, sorry, uh, to reach the following outcomes, as well as something is happening here. Just not click really. on the window again, that'll activate the active window. Click on your slide and you should be good. There you go. Okay, all right, sorry about that. All right, we provide, um, based on the principles modeled after the seven table stakes initiatives, and I'll talk to you about that later on. Um, we define specific um, uh, performance activities that will significantly advance digital transformation and successfully achieve, identify, address the underlying skills, roles, and workflow technologies and cultural changes required to achieve, to achieve these objectives of their chosen performance challenges. We develop the individual skills and organization capabilities needed to continue to work beyond the project using tools and methodologies. As well as we develop um, peer networks of news organizations to draw on shared experiences, approaches, technology, um, and other resources. That's the work of the Newsroom Initiative. The other project we have, and I'm sure many of you know about this, is our U.S. News Deserts. Um, the U.S. News Desert supports established and emerging local news organizations through applied research and analysis. The center documents the loss of local news across the United States while researching sustainable business strategies and innovative technologies for media organizations through three um, avenues of research. Our night chair in journalism and digital media economics, uh, Penny Abernethy, she leads the News Desert Project, which has produced three reports assessing the U.S. local news landscape, as well as two books, The Strategic Digital Media Entrepreneur and Saving Community Journalism, aimed at helping uh, media organizations survive and thrive in the digital world. Um, you know, the, the News Desert Project documents areas of the county at risk of becoming news deserts, while also working with dozens of news organizations to create business strategies um, the center defines the news desert as communities out of rural of urban, where residents have limited access to sort uh, of credible and comprehensive news and information that feeds democracy. Um, and again, um, here are the books. We have the Expanding News Deserts. Um, we have the Thorthing Emergence of News Deserts, other reports that have been done. Um, we have the Rise of New Media Barons of Emerging Emerging Threats of News Deserts. And we're slated to have our new report um, in June of this year. So we're excited about that. Another very exciting project that we recently just um, um, uh, got involved in. Um, so as we know that uh, is our project OASIS. So our news desert research has well defined the dynamic trends and causes of industry challenges. Project OASIS brings us to the next step. Where are the opportunities? 
we are partnering with Google News Initiative, Lions Publishing, and Doug Smith, who is the architect of the Table Stakes Initiative, for something community for, for something communities hard hit by the challenges with the hopes of making that knowledge shareable and replicable for new generations of news publishers. Last month, we began um, surveying digital native local news organizations in the United States and Canada to shine a light on business strategies that have some apart, that, that have set themselves apart from others. Um, and so that's really uh, one of the projects. We, we have surveys that we're doing, and it's a, we can talk a little bit more about that. Um, project Oasis. And then finally, I wanted to share, it's not, is what I said was the Ida B. Wells Society. The Ida B. Wells Society was founded by um, Nicole Hannah Jones, Ron Nixon, and Topher Sanders. Um, these founders um, uh, worked together um, to present a new take on a familiar mission. Uh, we are a news trade organization with the mission of increasing the ranks and retentions of uh, profiles, reporters, and editors of color in the field of investigative, rep uh, investigative reporting. And again, I'll, I'll stop there and then we can continue the conversation from there. Thanks, Susan. Um, we're now gonna move to Nathan Morabito with WCNC. Hey everyone, my name is uh, Nate Morabito. I'm with WCNC Charlotte. I am an investigative reporter there and uh, I am working mainly with the Charlotte Journalism Collaborative. I have been for gosh, a little bit more than the last year now. And Charlotte's my hometown. So this has been both personally and professionally gratifying for me. I remember a day when I went out to interview Charles Thomas uh, in the historic West End for somewhat of a solutions-based story about housing in that neighborhood, a historically black neighborhood. And I said, this place looks familiar to me. And it turned out I went to elementary school in that very same neighborhood when Charlotte had bus kids across town to go to school. And it just felt really fulfilling for me to be doing a story that's meaningful in the same neighborhood, essentially, where I went to school. And so I, I think that has made a big impact as we went through the, the collaborative personally. Now, professionally, WCNC Charlotte is not the number one TV rated TV station in Charlotte. Unfortunately, we're going to be there at some point. We do have the, the number one uh, website. Well, what I found in my, my two years back in Charlotte, my hometown, after being away for about 20 years, is that it's incredibly hard to get traction and make an impact in this kind of a news town. Now, don't get me wrong, everyone's supportive of each other. You know, other journalists lift each other up, but it's so competitive and there is so much noise. There are so many different news agencies that it's really hard some days to make a difference. And that's kind of what I've found the most rewarding part about this collaborative is that we've been able to see some of our work kind of cut through the noise a little bit. And I wanna see if we can share my screen for a second. So I know, I know David uh, put a link to the, the Charlotte Journalism Collaborative's uh, website. This is it right here. You'll find so many good stories on this site here from a lot of the different partners. And you can see all the different partners there. There are quite a few from uh, many different uh, news backgrounds. And I wanna talk just for a minute about some of the most recent work that we did uh, regarding Nashville shipping container apartments. So our focus is solutions journalism. It has been regarding affordable housing in Charlotte. And so during a trip to Nashville, we looked at what was going to become the largest shipping container apartment complex in the United States. Nashville is a similarly sized uh, city to Charlotte. They have a major league soccer stadium that's going in right near this complex. And we wanted to see if this is even a possibility, but because up until this point, it's kind of been brushed off as, eh, you know, Maybe at some point down the road, we'll look at it. But, but quite honestly, before this pandemic hit, people needed places to live and they still do more than ever. So we, we went there, we interviewed the apartment uh, complex, the, the person that was developing it, the architect. And this was funded through the Charlotte Journalism Collaborative. And what happened is the pandemic started kind of occurring. The mayor finally acknowledged that this may be a solution. And we haven't reported this yet, but there are some things moving behind the scenes now uh, with the city council as well that's kind of made this a topic of conversation. And I don't think that this would be possible if we had just tried doing this ourselves. You know, yes, we, we have tons of followers and we still have a, a relatively good television audience, but we have several other partners throughout this that continues to help us reach some new audiences. And I also 
want to talk a little bit about a project we did on housing vouchers. Uh, it, it started out with just, you know, Charlotte doesn't have enough housing vouchers. And quite a few of the housing vouchers would expire before people could even use them. And so using the solutions kind of um, mindset, we looked at other places to see how much time they give uh, their voucher holders and if that is in fact effective. And it turns out it was, of course. And so eventually uh, our Congresswoman brought what we found to uh, HUD Secretary Ben Carson and ultimately the Charlotte Housing Authority gave families more time to use those vouchers. And it's something that the, some of my colleagues have covered as well. I know David Borax from the FAE has covered this as well. But I think that the key about a collaborative is to make something impactful, you really have to get people talking about it. And at a time in society when people are so easily distracted, the more weight you have behind a project, the better the chances are that someone's gonna pay attention. And once they pay attention, you want to want them to keep talking about it. So for me, that's really been a great opportunity. And I just have to say this collaboration, having been in the business for almost 20 years, um, you know, I have experience, uh, not nearly as much as some of my colleagues, but I also work along people who are kind of brand new to the business, even in a top 25 TV market. And what this allows us to do, to, despite the challenges of our newsroom, even with staffing, we're able to tap into some of the experts with institutional knowledge in our city, journalists that have covered beats in Charlotte for decades and basically kind of live off them a little bit and kind of pick their brains. And, you know, it's a symbiotic relationship. We share what we, we have, but we also get the benefit of taking and running whatever they discover. And I know that ultimately through these conversations, we were able to, to really take a, a look nationwide at housing vouchers. And it wouldn't have happened without this collaborative to find out that the city of Charlotte gets far fewer vouchers than it should have from the beginning. We looked at every city in the United States and through that we were able to make a real determination of kind of how we got here and it really started with an idea among a group of seasoned reporters in the library and it kind of grew into something that I think no one had covered before. So ultimately I think it's, it's made a big difference and I don't think we were there yet. I think we're still evolving but uh, I, I've been inspired working with this group of journalists here in Charlotte. Thanks, Nate. We're going to move on to uh, Angie with Carolina Public Press. Hey, everyone. Um, this is Angie coming from Asheville, North Carolina. I am uh, the executive director of Carolina Public Press. We're a statewide nonprofit news organization, and our mission is to provide in-depth and investigative reporting in the public interest for all of North Carolina. And that's our mission. Our goal is to be the go-to investigative news arm for the state. Um, and I love that phrase investigative news arm because it can be flexed for many different people and in many different situ situations. But we know that that means if we're going to do this, that that means collaborations. And so the idea of collaboration is just interwoven in our, the um, everyday work that we do at Carolina Public Press. And so there are two things that I wanted to highlight um, among the, the uh, uh, all the work that we do that's collaborative. Um, but one is that we um, are often asked to collaborate and we often seek out and have ideas for collaborations. But we uh, really try to focus on high level criteria and priorities for our organization. So one of the first things we ask is, is this investigative? Um, and almost all the collaborations that we do within the state and nationally are investigative in nature. And as a result, about 50% of all the work that our news team does is devoted to working in collaboration and, and in partnerships. So we spend a lot of time thinking about collaborations because we know to be that investigative news arm that collaborations is a, is a must. It's the difference between us being able to lift five pounds by ourselves and 500 pounds together. Um, so some examples of the collaborations that we've done um, since we launched in 2011. Um, at, at that time, we were really focused in Western North Carolina, the 18 westernmost counties of the state, Appalachia. 
Um, within one year of forming and launching, we led a lawsuit to push for public records about evidence handling in a police department. Um, and then fast forward where we uh, participated in several other lawsuits. Um, and then in 2018, we decided that Carolina Public Press should go statewide and that we should take these collaborations statewide. We wanted to test whether and in what conditions we could lead a statewide investigative reporting collaboration. And we wanted to pilot that effort to see if it would have any kind of impact on the news ecosystem across the state. And when I, and when I say that, I mean for, for all 100 counties of North Carolina. So we took that idea to the North Carolina Local News Lab Fund and they helped us get started and, and funded what became um, the Seeking Conviction Collaboration and two great members of, of our team, Stephanie Carson and Frank Taylor, will talk in great depth about that tomorrow. Um, but just briefly, I want to say that um, that collaboration uh, published about a year ago after taking a look at four and a half years of court data on the prosecution of sexual assault cases in North Carolina. And we looked at every single DA in the state and that took 10 partners. When we had this idea, we wanted, uh, you know, we thought, well, maybe there'd be two or three <laughs> groups out there that would want to work with us on this. But at the end of the day, almost everyone that we talked to said yes. And that was amazing and speaks to the um, incredible people that you're hearing from today and others who aren't on this call. Um, so we had 10 uh, news partners in TV, digital, radio, print, combinations. Um, of that to to work with us and we had incredible impact across the state that um, you know, Stephanie and Frank can share more about tomorrow. But um, the, the second thing that I want to iterate it that I think is important about our work is that um, because we focus on collaborations, we believe in them so strongly, we've really focused on and invested in um, members of our leadership team to help manage that. Um, Sierra said an amazing thing that I want to um, put a point on too, and I totally agree with her, is that you know, they win, we win, um, and that we have to have some shared values. And I, I, I truly believe that at Carolina Public Press that in order for us to succeed, we have to set ourselves up to succeed and our partners up to succeed. So we have a person on our team that is devoted to collaborations, and that's Stephanie Carson. She's our News and Community Partnerships Manager. And she helped lead um, with our uh, managing editor, Frank, um, the seeking conviction um, effort that included not only the report, reporting, but also uh, six community engagement efforts across the state, uh, from listening sessions with survivors and advocates to news forums where legislators came and talked about legislation in North Carolina. So I'm really pleased to be a part of Carolina Public Press and this really, this um, um, ethic of collaboration that we bring. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Angie. Uh, we're gonna move on to Rick Thames at Queens University. Uh, here we are. Thanks, Charles. Um, yes, I, uh, I'm Rick Thames uh, and I teach journalism at the James L. Knight School of Communication at Queens University. And prior to that, I was the executive editor of the Charlotte Observer. And uh, same as Glenn, I can remember when uh, collaborations uh, weren't so cool. <laughs> and a lot of us in Charlotte have been part of collaborations since at least the 1990s. But um, the reason that uh, Queens is interested in this is that it's primarily, its primary mission is journalism uh, focused on digital literacy and media literacy, but um, it wants to do more for journalists in this region. And, and so it would like to be a resource. And I'm now part of the Charlotte Journalism Collaborative and um, happy to be working with the other partners. And I would say, when you think about uh, your own collaborative, if you haven't involved a university, there are probably at least three reasons to think about doing that. Um, one of them is the expertise that you might benefit from uh, if that university has a focus on journalism or even just on civic life. And there often are people there who are teaching, who are former journalists themselves and they know what uh, you're up against, they know what you're trying to do, and they can be supportive um, in the way that um, 
you know, I try to be supportive with this journalism collaborative. I attend their meetings as much as possible. And when they uh, can use my help, I will brainstorm with them on story ideas, um, think through things that we could be doing and certainly participate in some of the, the live events that they are part of. Uh, the second reason uh, I think you can really benefit from a university um, partnership is that um, that's a place where there are a lot of students who are interested in becoming journalists and they're looking for ways to um, practice journalism, either in an individual project or uh, maybe it's through an internship. And uh, that's something that, that um, there are always opportunities to do that sort of thing. And then, and then the third thing is, is to think about, you know, your university as a resource for facilities because universities, um, they have classroom space, of course, a lot of them have auditoriums. They have places where you could convene groups uh, where you could have your own meetings. And that's the thing that Queens has attempted to do for this journalism, journalism collaborative. And I think a lot of universities could also be helpful in that way. Thank you. Thanks, Rick. And um, to wrap up our introductions, we're going to have um, Robin, uh, who is with the Raleigh News and Observer. Hey, uh, thanks, Charles. Uh, my name is Robin Tomlin. I am the editor of the News and Observer and the Herald Sun in Raleigh, North Carolina. I'm also, oh, am I muted? Nope, is good. it working? Okay, <laughs> I was getting a message. Uh, I'm also the regional editor for McClatchy Southeast Newsroom, so I work with 11 newsrooms across um, uh, four states in the Southeast. Um, but I'm here actually representing the, the North Carolina News Collaborative, a collaborative effort that we pulled together a little more than a year ago um, that represents 22 daily newspapers um, in really every corner of the state. We, we have um, newsrooms in all of the major metro markets, and then in a lot of small communities across the state. Um, we, uh, coming, I came back, I grew up in North Carolina and came back to North Carolina a little more than two and a half years ago um, to help, uh, you know, work with my hometown paper and try to, um, try to help us find our path to sustainability. And, um, you know, I have a collaboration really in my, in my genes, in my bones, actually going back to a collaboration that Rick, um, and his team at the uh, Charlotte Observer helped lead back in the 90s. Um, I remember being involved in that uh, early in my career and seeing the value of being able to work together um, really to, um, to elevate journalism and, um, and, and to fill in gaps that we all have in our, in our, um, in our organizations. Um, and the, the News and Observer is actually, I was counting this up today, involved in nine active um, different collaboratives right now. Some of them national, some of them regional, some of them, um, uh, you know, some of them uh, just within our state. And, and it's an exciting time really for all of us to be able to um, not just kind of be able to work within the confines of the people within our rooms, but to be able to look for opportunities to connect the dots in ways that makes all of us better. Um, but the North Carolina News Collaborative really came together um, uh, almost by accident, uh, a number of editors from um, these different papers were together at a uh, NC Press Association dinner. And we realized that, um, that all of these editors actually, uh, the, of most of the largest newsrooms in the state were all women. And we said, you know, we need to get together and talk about how we can help each other. And uh, once we had agreed to do that, mostly as just sort of a, a wonderful uh, support network, we said, you know, let's talk about, um, you know, who else should be here. And so we, we hosted a full day meeting in Raleigh about a year ago and spent the entire day, you know, with, with sticky notes and, and um, brainstorming, talking about what are the ways that we really, as daily newspapers in this state, can, can, can assist each other, can help each other. We came up with three core principles that um, we thought were important for all of us. The first was really just content sharing. Um, making an open network where um, we allow any of the other newspapers within the state to pick up and publish digitally and in print stories that are in um, any one of our individual papers. We have collectively um, the, the you know, largest number of journalists operating in the state between these 22 papers and they're doing amazing work and oftentimes the audiences for that work are, you know, somewhat limited. 
Um, so just by creating an easy and open content sharing network, we were able to really amplify both the work that's being done in different parts of, around the state, but also, um, you know, to, um, you know, to, to, um, you know, bring more attention to, um, you know, to all of the, the efforts that are happening. Um, it also helps to fill in gaps. A lot of our communities, the News and Observer is the only daily newspaper that is currently covering the legislature. We have five journalists there. Um, you know, others will come in and out, um, you know, during session. And, um, but a lot of folks really are interested in, the, in what's happening in between the core session times. And so by us allowing all of these newspapers to pick up that work, it helps them to fill in gaps in their own coverage. And so we quickly worked on a plan to do that kind of open content sharing, and we've been doing that for more than a year. The second real effort was around collaborative projects, finding ways that we can use the, really the scope and the range of all the places where we're located to do journalism that really matters. We published a few projects. One was a seven part series that we did on the urban rural um, divide in North Carolina. And we were able to do that from a lot of different angles because we had people located and embedded in those communities who really understood um, the, the, the differences and challenges that, um, that many of our urban and rural communities are facing right now. And then the third goal of the collaborative was really to bring shared resources together, whether that's reporting resources that we could, that we could come together um, and um, get the benefit of, or, um, you know, right now, the one thing that we've been able to do is to get a grant to help support a project manager who is working with um, the collaborative on a project funded by the, um, the Pulitzer Center. Um, so that, that's really been the, the, the kind of core effort, um, you know, involved with the, the, the news collaborative, but we're looking for new ways to try to grow uh, the impact of the work we do. Thank you so much, Robin, and thank you to all of you um, in your introductions. Um, uh, the question that I have, and I'll just ask one or two questions and, and then we'll go to the audience questions because we have quite a few and definitely want to get those um, asked. Um, but Rick, um, maybe you, Rick, uh, Robin, and maybe Glenn can just talk about, you know, what is it about, is there something special or uh, about North Carolina that is, has fostered these um, interaction, these collaboratives? I mean, what about egos? What about funding? I mean, uh, how, why, what are you, how, what, what has led us to this point? And, and then maybe even then begin, and we can open up to everybody, talk about what have been some of the challenges you've overcome. Well, I'll, I'll start by saying, and, and Melanie Sill was also part of that 1996 collaborative that we undertook. Uh, it was six newspapers, I believe, uh, four commercial TV stations, uh, public television and public radio. And that was 1996 when we covered the presidential election and the um, U.S. Senate race that year. And that had grown out of a collaborative that, uh, as far as I know, is the original collaborative in Charlotte, which was between the Charlotte Observer and WSOC TV, which goes back to 1992. And that was also about the coverage of politics. Um, I'd like to say it was just brilliance, but it wasn't. We were, we were nudged into it, frankly, and I want to give credit where credit is due. That first collaborative was the idea of the Pointer Institute, which was interested in doing some experimental work with how to cover politics differently. Um, a very visionary uh, man there uh, by the name of Ed Miller, who approached the Charlotte Observer and suggested that not only do we try some different styles of politics coverage, but we also collaborate with a TV station. And his point was, was the larger audience that um, would benefit from that. And I, th I think the reasons that you know, from that collaborative, uh, we uh, introduced the 1996 collaborative, and and then I think uh, you saw very credible news organizations doing this, and I think that encouraged other news organizations to give it a try. So the history of collaboratives in the state, I, I think, is really why you see so much cooperation now. Um, people have grown up experiencing this, seeing the value of it and uh, encouraging other people to get, take part in it. But I would encourage uh, Melanie and, and Robin and others to talk about that. Yeah, a, a good friend of mine, Jim Brady, likes to say we're in the huddling for warmth phase of journalism. And uh, I love that quote because I think it really does speak to, um, you know, really where we are um, right now. We're in a place where we really can't afford to have big egos that, that keep us from um, finding ways to work together. And, and I think, 
that um, you know both the the sort of groundbreaking work that was done back in the 90s and just the relationships that have been built over time i mean i came back to north carolina having worked in Asheville, having worked in wilmington having grown up in chapel hill having gone to unc having built relationships that i was able to come in and renew and you know everybody as soon as i walked in was so welcoming and said you know let's work together and that's a, a wonderful um you know a wonderful attitude to start from and to try to build from what I've appreciated is, uh, is the welcoming nature. Um, I'm not a Charlotte Observer. I'm not a Raleigh News and Observer. I'm not a WFAE. We are a, a small uh, independent newsroom. But uh, every collaborative that I've taken part in, I felt, uh, I felt welcomed. Uh, I felt wanted. Uh, my audience uh, has been appreciated. And uh, I like that uh, phrase as well, huddling for warmth. I think, I think we realize now that we are in this together and that, and that no matter how large you are, no single organization has, has, has it all. No one has, has, has all the resources. No one uh, has, all the, has all the audience. And if we want to reach the entire audience, then we have to uh, involve Larger, large newsrooms, small, small newsrooms, uh, LGBTQ newsrooms, so on, uh, uh, Spanish speaking newsrooms. And that is what I think we've done so well in Charlotte. We have been able to put aside the ego, to put aside that competitive nature that we all have, because let's face it, we are journalists. We like to compete. Uh, and you know, we, we love to ruin the other person's morning by having a story that they didn't have. Uh, and there is still, and there is still time for that. There is still a place for that, but there is also a place for coming together and doing what is best uh, for the audiences, uh, especially during a time of limited resources. Thank you. And so, if, were there anything like if 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 you're kind of talking to folks that were trying to start, you know, a collaborative in their area? Um, were there, are there some key points you would ask them to kind of think about as they are building a collaborative? And, um, you know, so, I mean, Glenn, you've talked about kind of the difference between large and big, and then maybe um, Alicia and Sierra just talk about, you know, involving what I've seen with, with Free Press in Charlotte is, you know, it's kind of breaking some of the ways that, that reporting is working in the community. And, and actually, Sierra, when I heard you speaking, you're talking about actually involving community in your collaborations. But I mean, maybe talk about what are some of the things you've, you've got to overcome in order to create the success. So Glenn, I'll start with you and then. Well, as I said, I, I think the first thing you have to overcome is, is just that competitive instinct that we all have as journalists. Uh, and, then, and then beyond that, I think we, you have to have some type of memorandum of, of understanding. Every collaboration that I've been a part of, there has been some type of governing document that spelled out how it would work, uh, how resources would be divided, what, what, what resources would be shared. Uh, those are the things that, I, that, that immediately come to mind in terms of, uh, in, in terms of starting point. Someone pointed out this morning that we actually didn't start with the, with a memorandum of understanding. Uh, I, I think it was Michael Davis from uh, Solutions Journalism Network who said we actually came in wanting to talk about the content first. What do we, you know, what what is it that 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 we wanted to accomplish as journalists and as newsrooms? And so uh, there has to be some vision of why you're doing it. After you have that vision of why, why you're doing it, then you have to put something down that's going to serve as a uh, governing document. And, and I, would, I would say too that um, it really helps when you're coalescing around an issue that everyone can agree on, that that's an issue that more coverage of would be a great public service. And that you take that public service journalism uh, approach um, that everyone can come around and say, this would be good for everybody. It doesn't need to be competitive. We're actually going to be better off if we're all working together than any one of us would be working separately. 
And that tends to help people get over their uh, jitters about, you know, working with their former competitor. Yeah, I think one of the, um, the biggest things that I think to consider when, when starting collaboratives or thinking about collaboratives or something to get over um, is this idea that every conversation needs to have a purpose before you're a part of it. Um, and, and I think this happens a lot, especially when we talk about kind of sources or interviews or conversations that you go into those conversations and the, the conversations and the interviews have a purpose. You kind of know what you want to get out of it. You kind of know why you're there already. Um, but when it comes to collaboration and especially collaborating with community members and with non-journalists, um, you have to build those relationships before the relationships can be mobilized or organized. Mm. Um, and, and I think that's a thing that we see and know across the South. Um, in the South, we, especially in communities of color, um, we, don't, we don't trust all the time, um, especially in all different kinds of communities at the various margins. Um, we, we build relationships with each other. Um, we, we sit at dinner tables, we sit at porches, all of those things that are, can sometimes be stereotypes of the South, but I like to hold with pride and power um, because those are the ways that we begin to mobilize and work together. Um, and I really, you know, Charles, you asked about if there's something about North Carolina that is different. And I really wanted to, to lift up that quote by W.E.B. Du Bois that, where he said, as the South goes, so goes the nation. And I really think, think if you consider some of these relational values and values around how we build with each other, um, that that makes the collaboration so much stronger. Um, yeah, I would just um, echo what Alicia has said and also um, add that uh, collaboration is um, not a quick fix. I think that um, a lot of times, um, especially in these very trying times when, you know, we're all worried about our revenue streams and how we're going to be able to continue to produce content. Um, it is innate to look for things that um, we can do quickly to uh, bring in revenue or to bring in more of an audience um, to be looking at our work. Um, but I would say that uh, collaboration, especially when you're talking about um, being in collaboration with community, is not that. Um, you know, as a Black queer woman um, from North Carolina, um, it's not even a quick fix for me. I cannot assume that just because folks share my identities that we're in community together, um, community really is rooted in um, showing up over and over and over again. Um, I think a really good example of this for us um, has been the work that we've done with the Fight for 15. Um, we have uh, published about um, the organizing that they're doing on the ground. Um, we have handed over our Instagram handle to them um, so that they could amplify their work. Um, and anytime that they are getting ready for an action or they're holding space, they reach out to us to cover that because we've built that trust and they know that um, they can come to us um, and that we are, um, yeah, just going to do justice to the work that they're doing. Um, and so that's just another thing um, that I would say, not so much to overcome, um, but to definitely be aware of. It's just, it's just that collaboration um, is not a quick solution to your work. Great. Um, I want to... Um, uh, I, I know, So I, I, I want to... Uh, actually, can I... Do it. So a couple of quick ads, and because I really want to get to the questions before we get we run out of time, and I'm going to turn that over to Stephanie. Thanks, Charles. Thank you, everybody. Um, yeah, I, I definitely I I want to get to a few other folks in the panel who um, who want to speak um, in just a moment. We do have a bunch of audience questions. Um, additionally, I just want to do a quick time check. So right now it is 2:20 Eastern Standard Time. So our panel today was going to wrap up at 2.30, but this is such a great conversation that we'll keep going a little longer. So we'll try to wrap up by 2.40, 2.45 to give you a break before the 3 p.m. session, just for time planning purposes. I want everyone to know that. So there are a bunch of questions in the Q&A and I've been reading through them and I'm going to try to get through as many as we can. So the first one I'll start with, there are several questions for the group around funding. And I'm going to start with Joellen Kaiser's question. She always asks, fan, asks fantastic questions um, because I think it's a good overview um, that will pull in some of the other funding questions that we have. 
So Joellen asks, uh, so far, most funding for news collaboratives seem to come directly or indirectly from philanthropy, but areas underserved by news often lack strong community philanthropy. The areas are underserved in all sorts of ways. So her question, she targeted first at Susan Leith, especially for Susan, but I think also others um, on this panel can answer it. Have you looked into funding models for collaboratives that are not based on philanthropy? So I don't know who would like to start with that one, Susan. Do you want to take that to start and then we'll go from there? Well, one of the things I was going to expand upon is just this conversation we were having before, which was so rich and meaningful. Um, you know, opportunities as far as funding, as far as collaboration is together in terms of where can um, organizations around the table, where can you find areas where you can partner together to seek the greater good? Um, you know, one of the things I wanted to kind of bring to the table on that one was, um, you, you know, just I, I wanted Angie to actually chime in on this one because uh, Angie uh, uh, did some phenomenal work in terms of finding other funding opportunities for Carolina Public Press, um, one of which was around her work um, with the sexual assault uh, initiative that she did that was just uh, extraordinary. And, there, and from there, she looked for opportunities, if you will, to establish endowments. And so I wanted, Angie, can you expand in terms of just some of the work that you've done with Carolina Public, Public Press, which has been really pretty extraordinary. And so she's, she's done has been, in my opinion, um, uh, uh, kind of a, uh, a, a leading the charge in that effort. So Angie, can you share a little bit about the work you've done with Caroline Public Press around that effort? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Susan. Um, and speaking to the revenue question, I think it's a good one and it's probably a longer term strategy um, for our organization anyway. I mean, certainly when we were piloting um, the Seeking Conviction project, um, which at the beginning we didn't even know was going to be seeking conviction. Um, but this the pilot of investigative reporting statewide and again, you know, for all 100 counties to your point about the underserved communities um, that may be in these deserts, you know, our, our purpose is to um, serve all 100 counties and not forget some of the rural communities uh, where I'm from in North Carolina. Um, but in terms of kind of revenue and revenue sharing, um, I think that's a, a longer term strategy for us as an organization and is certainly something that we think about and we are looking at models in, in the United States of collaborative um, investigative journalism efforts that uh, result in revenue shares for all partners versus kind of an overseeing organization um, or even um, yeah, so there's not like a pass through, um, which which tends to be, in my opinion, what, what you see most often. Um, but certainly Stephanie and other people um, are more more um, know more about that than than me. But I can say that in terms of our organization, whenever we talk about uh, with funders with individuals who support Carolina Public Press, we talk about collaboration and the work that we're, we do. Um, you know, where, whether it's, you know, emergency news team, which is what we're working on right now and partnering with Spanish language media um, or reaching out to rural newsrooms and saying, you know, hey, how can we help you? you know, like, let us be your freelancer and can we work in collaboration? Um, I mean, I think that that's, that's what we try to do. Great, thank you. So there's also a couple questions here uh, for Rick, specifically about students. How do you think that um, student journalists can best be brought into collaborations? I'm combining two people's questions there, but they were somewhat related. Well, I, I think students are always interested, uh, if, they're, if they're interested in the work of journalism, they're thinking about how can I get into uh, a real newsroom? How can I be part of uh, a real news process beyond, say, my campus newspaper? So what you can look for is you can look for either an individual project or a, uh, an internship opportunity. Uh, at Queen's University, all of our students are required to take to have an internship, and so they are always on the hunt for a good internship, and some of the times they get uh, internships uh, with money and other times it's just for academic credit, but um, they are um, interested and uh, you know, you may have an area university that has that situation and you, they could benefit from that. 
Yeah, also in our chat, uh, Chrissy Back pointed out, don't forget about including independent college media in collaborations as a full-time partner, which is something yes. that we do see in you know, a lot of collaborations around the country, in addition to, to just individual student journalists um, like, you, like we talked about. Um, another question from Charlotte West is a question I'm always very interested in too, so I love this question. Um, how could we better involve freelancers in all the different collaborative efforts that you've got going on, um, or independent journalists, especially as unfortunately we have more journalists who are entering the realm of being freelancers or being independent because they're being let go. So how can we better involve them in collaborations? And whoever would like to take that. Unmute yourself. Well, and I can speak to the Charlotte Journalism Collaborative. The yeah. Charlotte Journalism Collaborative is built in a way in which the uh, funding that it gets from the Knight Foundation, and it does get some funding from the Knight Foundation, um, it uses that money to hire freelancers. And so I got this question earlier from a freelancer, and the answer would be to get to know the partner organizations in the collaborative, and it could well be that they are in a position to hire you on a freelance basis on a particular story or particular project that they're working on. We, uh, the people in the collaborative in Charlotte have uh, employed quite a few freelancers. And in fact, a freelancer wrote one of the most substantial pieces of journalism, I think, uh, for this collaborative so far um, from uh, Brooklyn to Ballantyne. And uh, I may have it backwards, maybe some Ballantyne to Brooklyn. But the point is, it was the sort of the long history of affordable housing, the problems with affordable housing in Charlotte. And Glenn could speak to that, but that was a very successful um, adventure there. Actually, Rick, you said it all. <laughs> Does anyone else want to address discussing uh, freelancers or independent journalists with your collaborations? Let me just jump in and say that uh, with the Charlotte Collaborative, one of the critical points was when we began having uh, story meetings, story planning meetings with the journalists at the ground level, not the managers, and uh, generated a lot of ideas, most of which have been done. And we had several freelancers involved in that, and they have continued to report stories. Uh, the trick there is figuring out how to get that paid for or which news outlet to attach it to for financial purposes, um, there was some money in the collaborative to pay for some of that. But, you know, it, it, it may make sense to start with one news outlet and say, you know, WFAE will take this one on and we'll share it with everybody. And I'll say yeah. too, because because I was involved with, with some of those meetings that a project manager is really critical in helping keep all this organized and almost like a cheerleader or gatekeeper. Even before COVID-19, I was drowning daily with my work as it was, and I needed someone to say, hey, Nate, don't forget about this project, or what about this idea? Or if maybe if you're covered up too much, what if we have this person do it? I just think that's so important to keep us kind of engaged in the project and remind us that the end goal is to be turning content. Uh, so I would just say that's a real actionable thing to, to take away. Yeah. I, I would add to this, although I'm not part of the North Carolina panel, <laughs> but I would add something that I really want to see happen. I think like in, in different communities across the country, there are um, strong freelance networks. I know SPJ runs um, a national uh, freelance group. Shoe Leather is a new network of freelancers. And I really hope that we see more of those networks being built. We've been trying to build one in New Jersey so that collaborations like the ones that you all are, are involved in can like really easily hook into a group of freelancers in your area. Um, so a question comes from Holly Genvy. And after this question, I wanna get back to a couple revenue questions too. So she asked, um, even though collaborations may not be a quick solution, as I think Sierra really eloquently pointed out, um, do you think collaborate, collaborative, collaborative initiatives um, increase with the nature of a crisis like the pandemic that we're in right now? Thanks, Stephanie. I can jump in on that one. No um, I, abs I absolutely think so. Um, both because there are funders who I think who recognize, have recognized the value of collaboration in the work we're doing. I know several different organizations have put out calls immediately to try to support collaborative work and to make sure that there is some, um, some effort behind that. The, um, the um, Pulitzer Center um, put out an, an immediate um, call for collaborative efforts um, and grants to do around that. But, but I want to call out beyond um, sort of the established networks. In North Carolina, there's been kind of an interesting mixed media collaborative 
that I think now has a name, um, it's seven or eight different organizations, Carolina Public Press is one of them, um, that there are, I think, four TV stations, two newspapers, um, and a couple of nonprofits um, uh, who are all part of this, um, this collaborative, that has been producing stories every single week um, collaboratively and sometimes multiple times a week, investigative work, um, really focused on getting together and trying to answer the core questions that we've all been struggling to get our um, Department of Health and Human Services to answer. They've done a great, I and mean, one of the challenges with the, the coronavirus thing is that we can't get FaceTime with the public officials who need to be accountable to the actions uh, you know, that, they're, that they're taking. We get um, you know, phone call, press conferences where you can't ask follow-ups and where people are not responding to public records requests. And the power of coming together as a mixed media organization and all asking for this and holding them accountable when they're not giving answers to the people has actually been incredibly um, empowering, I think, for all of the different entities involved. I'm sure Angie can speak to that as well. Um, but it's also given us um, a platform together to, um, to really, um, you know, in some ways advocate for our readers, you know, in a, in a new way. Yep, great. Did anyone else want to uh, answer that or? Yeah, I just want to echo just quickly mm -hmm. what, what Robin was saying. I mean, that, um, that collaboration happened overnight. Um, I mean, it was amazing. And it's getting from the organic stage to being much more organized and probably a structure is going to be built around that, hopefully somewhat, somewhat soon. But yeah, to Robin's point, I mean, that collaboration, we were on the brink of, uh, you know, launching a lawsuit at the Department of Health and Human Services over nursing home data. These six organizations in North Carolina that had been working together for, you know, right from the beginning of COVID, really. Um, and then we're joined by, I guess, Robin, like 15 other groups that we're going to sign on to that. And that type of collaboration um, that is, that is, um, has the heft of kind of legal, um, uh, legal action when, when and if we need to take it really has impact. One of the wonderful things about that collaboration I'll mention is that uh, one of the media attorneys in the state has basically joined as a pro bono member of the collaborative and is in the Slack channel, his, his uh, you know, offering um, his, his help and advice in trying to really pressure to get the records that we really believe that the citizens deserve. And, and I think it's because these people are together, not, not you know, rather than working with any individual group um, on their own. Yeah, absolutely. Those coalitions can make a huge difference. So I lied because I said we were going to go to a revenue question next. <laughs> There's actually another uh, couple other questions I want to get to before we go back to money and wrap up. Um, so Andrew David Gall asked a question that um, I like for a few reasons. And I think it's also a good point to bring Alicia back in because uh, I think she could be an excellent person to start answering this question. So Andrew says, it seems like collaboration with communities have different lessons, needs, and approaches than collaborations between newsrooms. Um, is it worth creating that distinction? And um, I'll throw it to whoever would like to answer if Alicia's there. And one other thing I'll note is that uh, this, my center, Center for Cooperative Media, we are gonna publish a guide specifically on that topic um, next month. It's being written by Heather Bryant. So I know she's watching and listening. So Alicia, do you wanna take that one? To start yeah, with? I Thanks. You know, I, I think that there are, I think it can seem like there are different needs between community collaboration and newsroom collaboration. And I think if we take the values and the lessons and the needs that we have for community collaboration into the way that we do newsroom collaboration, that it'll make all of those collaborations more sustainable. Um, and I, I think about when we think about conflict or groups kind of disintegrating or, or falling apart, usually that has to do with the quality of the relationships that existed in the first place. And that's true when we talk about community collaboration, but it's also true when we talk about newsroom collaboration. Um, and I, I think it comes down to some of the core tenets of how we build relationships with each other. Um, like some people we, we build with because we do work together. Um, but it really deepens that work when we're also able to get coffee together or have dinner together or catch up with each other and take a walk around the park. Um, it's not necessary all the time to have a, a working relationship, um, but it certainly always does deepen those relationships. And so I, I think if we can figure out um, how, to, how to learn from community collaborations, that that'll only enhance the sustainability of the newsroom collaborations. 
That's Can right. I add something to that? Go ahead. The, the one thing that I want to make sure that we also are thinking about things through the lens of in collaboration is making sure that um, who do you have at the table when you're making those decisions around collaboration to make sure that you're pulling in underrepresented communities as well. I mean, I think that's one of the things that I have seen in some of the collaboration, collaborative efforts um, is that folks are making sure that um, they're considering, you know, who is at the table to make sure that they're tapping into, um, you know, all areas uh, to make sure that underrepresented communities are also including those collaborations. And I know folks are asking about funders and funders are looking for that kind of intentional effort to make sure that um, you are looking through that lens, um, if you will, um, when you're building out collaborative efforts. I just wanted to make sure I, I share that as well as I've been listening to the conversation. Okay. Thanks, Susan, that's a great point. So I'm gonna combine a couple of questions here that relate to revenue um, because they're somewhat related. Um, so the overall question is how is money split up typically when it comes into collaborations that you all are part of when there is external funding, who does it go to? Um, and so this combines a couple of questions. One, um, uh, one of our uh, attendees asked, how do you handle differences in salaries when you design a collaboration? Who, who gets paid what? Um, because it can be frustrating if you're unemployed or freelancing to maybe get paid the same amount that someone who um, is at a different organization is getting paid. Um, someone else in the chat also pointed out that collaborating, uh, collaborating sometimes is difficult, especially for small news organizations that don't have the resources that a larger news organization might. Um, and how do you help them? So I don't know who wants to tackle that question um, about when there is money, how do you allocate it? Where does it go? I think that goes to the uh, goes back to what I talked about earlier in terms of having a uh, memorandum of understanding or some type of governing document. Uh, in the uh, Charlotte Journalism Collaborative, we don't, uh, we don't disperse funds as such to the, to the organizations. Uh, we budget money that each organization can then use to, re to do reporting. And so uh, whether you are the Charlotte Observer or Q City Metro, you get the same amount of money to uh, do reporting. Uh, in terms of uh, freelance, uh, how much freelancers are paid, each organization determines that. Uh, the Charlotte Observer with its uh, resources uh, from this collaboration may pay its freelancers one amount. Uh, Q City Metro may pay its freelancers a different amount. We don't, uh, we don't try to micromanage to that uh, degree. I remember one, one of the earlier uh, collaborations that I was a part of, I mentioned it earlier, covering the arts. And it quickly became apparent that, uh, that uh, splitting the money 50, uh, down the middle or giving, in, giving an equal amount to each partner was not the way to go in that particular inst instance, in that particular instance. Uh, the Charlotte Observer had many more people. They were able to generate much more content than I could, yet we had the same amount of money. So the Charlotte Observer ran out of resources, ran out of money before I did. And so rather than just sit on my money, I said, hey, look, uh, why don't you guys take some of this money, generate content? I get to, I get to publish it anyway. So it's not like I'm giving something away uh, that, uh, you know, that, that I'm not going to get back because the, uh, in, in turning that money back over to the larger organizations that were able to do more with it, uh, I still was able to accomplish my ultimate goal, which was to publish more content. Rick, do you want, Rick, do you have any thoughts on that? I just, We'll say that we were happy to take the money that you couldn't use and, and we were able to use it. And you're right. I mean, we were able to um, cover the arts and then distribute that content to all the partners. And so um, it, it worked well. I, I think that it's really important that all the partners come to the collaboration with a sense of respect for one another, uh, um, a sense that, you know, in terms of making decisions to how you create that memorandum of understanding that everybody has an equal, you know, say in it. And one of the great things about this collaborative is I 
I see that everybody uh, listens to everyone else and takes their, um, their situations into account. So um, that's really important, I think, for it to work well. Great. Anyone else? Or? No? So um, I think that we're going to wrap up. We have a few other questions in the chat. And if any of our panelists are able to get in there and um, answer some of these questions live, I think that would be fantastic. Um, otherwise, we are uh, going to move forward. I am, first of all, I just want to say thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you to everyone on the panel today um, from North Carolina. This was a fantastic conversation. I think you absolutely showed us why you are the state of collaboration, as I like to say. <laughs>